Welcome to the Wanderers History Podcast and to a new episode of the series Rulers and Monarchs of the 16th Century Mediterranean in Europe. Today, we'll talk about a familiar historical figure, one which was mentioned and discussed plenty of times during the short history of Charles V, arguably one of Charles's nemesis, along with Suleiman the Magnificent. Today, we'll talk about Francis I, King of France. Before we continue, I'd like to remind you to please hit that subscribe button to never miss any new material from the podcast. Let us resume. Francis was born in September 1494 at the Chateau du Cognac, the only son of Charles of Orléans, Count of Angoulême, and Louise of Savoy. He became King of France on January 1st, 1515, and was crowned at the Cathedral of Reims on the 25th of January 1515. The House of Valois was very concerned about the Habsburg monarchy surrounding France. After Charles was King of Spain, he then became Holy Roman Emperor, ending up ruling over one of the vastest European and global empires of the 16th century. For a brief moment, there was a possibility of Francis becoming Emperor, which did not happen in the end. For more on that, I would advise people to go to the uh, first episode of the short history of Charles V. The rule of Francis was focused mainly on combating the forces of Charles V, uh, especially during the Italian wars. France was a notable presence in both wars of the Leagues of Cambrai and then Cognac. The War of the League of Cambrai ended with a Franco-Venetian victory made official by the Treaty of Noyon, which was signed by both Francis and Charles V in August of 1516, recognizing French claims to Milan and Spanish claims to Naples, removing Spain from the war. France would prioritize its claims to the Duchy of Milan, Kingdom of Naples, but also influence in Genoa. The situation would escalate once again in 1521 with the Italian War of 1521-1526, a brutal part of the Italian Wars. A pivotal moment was the 1525 win at Pavia for uh, Charles and Spanish imperial forces, where the French army was decimated, and most importantly, Francis got captured and imprisoned in Madrid. It was a notable win for Charles and a heavy defeat for Francis, who ended up humiliated by his arch-rival. The Treaty of Rome in 1525 led to the restoration of the Sforzas in Milan under the protection of Charles V. The Treaty of Madrid in 1526 forced Francis to renounce all claims to the Duchy of Milan and give Burgundy to the House of Habsburg in exchange for his release. This peace was short-lived, and Clement V and Francis sought to re repel Spanish imperial influence in the Italian peninsula. Thus, the War of the League of Cognac emerged. It is important to note that by this point, the Reformation was taking roots in France, not to the initial extent which we saw happen in Germany. Initially, Francis displayed a certain level of tolerance towards the Protestants in France, much more than Charles did in the German lands of the Holy Roman Empire. The War of the League of Cognac resulted in a Habsburg success obtained in a brutal fashion, mainly because of what happened with Rome and its sacking in 1527. The Siege of Naples would also be a Spanish victory. Andrea Doria, arguably one of the most powerful admirals in Genoa and the Italian peninsula, would shift, along with a large part of the Genoese nobility, towards Spain, becoming one of the key naval commanders in the service of Charles V, with Charles's coronation at Bologna illustrating once more another Habsburg triumph in Italy, Francis realized that in order to stand a chance against Charles, he had to resort to more unconventional methods, and that would be an alliance with Suleiman the Magnificent, Ottoman Sultan, and fierce opponent of both Austrian and Spanish Habsburgs. Francis I intended to launch a crusade against the Ottomans in 1518 with most Western Christian princes apart from the Venetians, as Pope Leo X always suspected them of tacit agreements with the Turks. This crusade did not come to fruition, yet Francis needed the help of arguably the strongest navy in the Mediterranean, led by legendary figures like Hayreddin Barbarossa. 
Once again, in 1536, another Italian war would commence, as Francisco Sforza II passed away leaving no heirs in Milan. A Franco-Turkish fleet was stationed in Marseille in the final months of 1536. In 1537, Barbarossa started a series of raids on the Italian peninsula, but also Corfu. With an obvious boost from the Ottomans, this time Charles and Francis signed a treaty at Nice in 1538, without significant changes, which left Franco-Imperial hatred simmer even longer. Charles would be persuaded to join the Holy League, along with the papacy and Venice, against the Ottomans, which ended with a crucial Ottoman victory at Prevezza in 1538, part of the Third Ottoman-Venetian War. However, the Franco-Ottoman alliance would continue, in fact, for many centuries up until the Napoleonic Wars in Egypt. It was one of the most important diplomatic and military alliance of the 16th century European history, one which caused controversy at the time given that a Catholic monarch would side with an Ottoman sultan perceived as one of the main threats of both Orthodox and Catholic Christianity. To a certain extent, the Venetians were also under the suspicion of such tacit collaborations or alliances with the Ottomans, given the economic ties the Republic had with the Porte and with a mostly Ottoman-controlled Levant and Egypt. France needed the Ottoman navy and army to distract both Austrian and Spanish Habsburgs, Francis I was in a predicament as he saw France surrounded in the east by the Holy Roman Empire, west by Spain, and in Italy, Charles's and Spanish imperial influence were growing. Add also the problematic relations with England and the slow emergence of Protestantism in France, and we get an idea of how complicated Francis's rule was. Eventually, in 1538, the Truce of Nice was signed, as Charles had to pay attention to internal matters of the empire. Because of this, until 1542, relations with the Ottomans would suffer for the French. Then, the Italian War of 1542-1546 followed, a financially cumbersome endeavor for both sides and a war which had an inconclusive outcome. In 1547, Francis died at the Chateau de Rambouillet, his reign being perceived by many as one very complex. All in all, it can be argued that he was ultimately defeated by Charles V if we look at the outcome of the Italian wars and the Treaty of Cato Cambresis, which happened a few years after his death in 1559, that being the Treaty of Cato Cambresis. He did, however, prevent further potential losses by ensuring the protection and assistance of the Ottoman navy in the Mediterranean, though this came at a cost especially when it came to the papacy. To a certain extent, Francis did contain and one can argue postpone the effects of Protestantism in France if we were to compare to the events in the empire, what happened with Luther there. Though there were turbulent episodes like the affair of the placards in 1534, the Edict of Fontainebleau in 1540, and the Merindol Massacre of 1545, notable reforms did take place during Francis's reign, who was very much a Renaissance monarch and a patron of arts. In 1530, he made French the official language of the kingdom, seeking to diminish the influence of Latin. His cultural legacy is perhaps the most important, being a pivotal figure of the development of the Renaissance in France. Francis was succeeded by Henry II of France, whose reign was the last before the French of French wars of religion would have a cataclysmic effect over the French kingdom after 1560. Too. I hope to be able to talk about his rule, the, the one of Henry II and the French Wars of Religion in another mini-series at some point in the future. Thank you for listening to this episode of the short history of the French King Francis I, mostly to do with the impact of his rule in Europe and the Mediterranean. Please make sure you subscribe to never miss any new material from the podcast. And until the next time, all the best. <music>